right, so thank you so much, Senator, for joining us this morning on this ASP chat. Nice to meet you. Likewise, thank you. As you know, Starting Point has teamed up with Newsweek this month to focus as a special series on Generation Z and the future of American politics. Today, we're going to talk about technology as Generation Z has a pretty unique uh, perspective uh, and uh, experience of technology. They've grown up in an era where there's been incredible things that are possible, but also new challenges like privacy, governmental regulation, free speech. Let's start by talking about governmental regulation and antitrust. Simply, can you just define antitrust for us and talk about how that relates to big tech? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, antitrust is all about ensuring that consumers benefit from vigorous competition between various market participants. Uh, when, when businesses don't face competition, or if they can somehow manage uh, to, to find a way to avoid it, then they generally will charge higher prices and provide lower quality goods or services. And they become less innovative in the process. Uh, the, the, the market stagnates and consumers suffer uh, all as a result of this absence of competition. Now, we've seen some of this in the tech space specifically. We're a long way off from the dot-com boom of the 90s and the web 2.0 and the early 2000s. Companies that were, you know, once innovative disruptors uh, are now in some cases becoming more entrenched monopolists. Consumers flock to some of these companies' services because they were desirable, they were unique, they were innovative. But now that some of these tech giants have, have secured a significant amount of market power, we as consumers are starting to experience some of the real downsides from that. Uh, uh, for, from the lack of competition that they're now facing, including reduced quality, uh, including through privacy violations, through speech censorship and things like that, and, and through stifled innovation, which uh, shows up in the form of some of these companies stepping in and buying up nascent competitors, uh, smaller companies that could in the future start to pose a threat to them, and so they buy them up. Facebook and Google are the subject of ongoing litigation by state and federal justice departments, and Amazon and Apple are, all, are also under scrutiny. Uh, do you believe government should break up any of these large tech companies for antitrust reasons? And if so, why or why or why not? First of all, I'm glad that we've got the competition laws that we have and the antitrust enforcers uh, that we do, and that they're looking into these things because I think there are some very concerning um, issues that need to be looked into whether it results in breaking them up or, or what other remedy might end up being issued it's going to depend on what federal and state governments are, are able to prove in court and about whether and to what extent and, and in what ways these companies might be harming competition uh, and, and harming consumers in the process now i can easily imagine ways in which breaking up a company entirely could actually um, harm consumers by disaggregating services that might be more useful when they're bundled together. But there might also be certain lines of business that don't necessarily need to be part of a, a single company. And it's possible that the judge could find that separating them uh, will be necessary to restore competition. A breakup remedy is certainly a possibility, but uh, more needs to be seen first uh, about what they can prove in court. Google's advertising business is a focus of antitrust lawsuits. So the majority of Google's revenue comes from ad sales, which is brought, I believe, $135 billion for the company in 2019. So when it comes to advertising technology in general, should there be more or less control over how those big tech companies can collect and use our personal data to customize an individual's experience online? I support giving individuals more control and more, con more transparency over how their own personal data is collected and how it's used. I should add here, antitrust laws aren't there to simply break up any big company just because it's a big company. Big doesn't always necessarily mean bad. The question is not whether a company has become big, but whether the company in question has acted in an anti-competitive, monopolistic manner. Um, and so that's really the question that uh, has to be addressed. One of the many ways in which uh, a lack of competition or anti-competitive behavior might manifest itself when you start to see a company that um, 
disrespects its own customers and disrespects their own privacy interests, for example, one has to wonder why. Likewise, when you see a company that doesn't seem to care whether or not it's insulting large segments of the population by, for example, uh, making politically outrageous comments uh, when they know that half of their customers might feel a different way, one has to wonder uh, whether they've achieved a, a monopolistic status. And, and sometimes that can be a, a signal that other things are going on that that deviate from what we want, which is competition in each marketplace. Sure. Uh, how has the integration of technology into our everyday lives affected individual privacy? And should there be more or less privacy protection for individuals using the internet? We certainly need uh, protection, uh, privacy protections one way or another. Throughout my 10 years in Congress, I've supported protecting the privacy of individual Americans, both online and from government surveillance. And uh, I've long supported the use of encryption when necessary to protect an individual's data. I also think it's really important that we not um, uh, allow for government to make an end run around encryption by giving government a backdoor key because that can end up eroding people's privacy and security uh, uh, really, really fast. And I also think we've got to uh, continue to pay attention to what um, big tech giants, in, including Google, do. You know, last, last year as chairman of the Senate's Judiciary Committee's Antitrust Subcommittee, I held a hearing on Google's dominance um, uh, of the online advertising or, or ad tech industry and how their role as, as buyer and seller and auctioneer in the online ad tech space ends up hurting competition. And you know, here again, I leave it to courts to decide what the remedy there is, but it wouldn't surprise me if a judge found that breaking up that business might improve competition and benefit both the ad tech space and consumers. And uh, that that is of course one step removed from the privacy issue, but again, when a company starts disrespecting someone's privacy or their uh, closely held personal views or political views, they start doing that en masse. It, it does have to make one wonder whether they feel and in some ways are perhaps because of their own anti-competitive conduct and manipulation, whether they are, are monopolists who have avoid, avoided competition. It's, it's such an important fine line, right? Because there is so much control in these companies over our data. And the way you break it down is, is, is really great. Delving further into the government's role regarding the tech industry, what would be, or if any, new reforms or regulations you would recommend that the government make? You know, one of them is embodied in a bill that I wrote, a bill that I've introduced called the Promise Act. Uh, I've designed it to hold big tech companies accountable for their promises, to not operate their social media platforms uh, uh, or, or search engines, for example, with political bias and in an open and transparent manner. The, my bill, the, the, the Promise Act, would require tech companies to abide by their own publicly available information, um, their information policies, or their terms of service, their con content moderation um, terms of service, for example, uh, that, that users can easily access and, and under, uh, understand. Um, this is legislation that would then hold uh, these tech companies accountable if they misrepresent their content moderation policies by stating that, that violations of their own policies or of statements made by their CEOs would constitute an unfair or deceptive uh, act or, or practice in violation of Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act. Now, I, I tend to disfavor regulation as a whole because one size fits all regulations, uh, which is you know what we typically have uh, through the federal government, tend to be exceedingly difficult to craft. But that's one benefit of antitrust enforcement. It's very fact specific and, it, it, and, and remedies can be narrowly tailored to address specific competitive harms. And that's one of the reasons why um, I drafted the Promise Act the way I did. Well, that one's not technically an antitrust law. It's, it, it would be enforced by the Federal Trade Commission, one of the two antitrust enforcement agencies. 
and it uh, would allow it to be regulated based on deceptiveness. The deceptive trade practices are already unlawful, but we should specify that this is one way that you can engage in a, uh, in a deceptive trade practice is to misstate your own content moderation policies. Sure. So then would you say that government regulation of big tech could help reduce online hate speech or misinformation and uh, why or why not? Look, I, I fully support and protect the First Amendment and, and the, the right to free speech that it provides um, for a number of reasons, not just because it's in the Constitution, it's what it requires, but also because on a more practical policy level, I think more speech rather than less speech provides really the best way to combat hate speech or misinformation. Um, now, there are certain kinds of speech, things like yelling fire in a crowded theater when there is no fire, are not protected by the First Amendment. Um, but the overwhelming majority of speech is protected. My concern with censorship by big tech is who makes the call? Who is it who would get to make the call about what would constitute mis misinformation or hate speech? As we've seen over the last few years, conservative speech and conservative political ads or anything having to do with any Republican candidate or Republican leaning organization, these are all of the, the, the people who are most likely to draw the ire of big tech censors. So in the name of, of policing uh, hate, hate speech and, and misinformation, a lot of what some of these folks are doing is um, just engaging in a deceptive trade practice, one in which they draw in users, customers, consumers, with the promise that they will be politically even-handed, and then do quite the opposite of that. You know, a few months ago, I had uh, uh, the CEOs of uh, both Facebook and Twitter in front of two different committees I serve on, the Commerce Committee and um, the Judiciary Committee. I serve on both. And I asked both of them about this issue, pointing out that we can all name 5, 10, 15, 20 examples off the top of our heads uh, of Republican or conservative candidates or groups uh, that have been deplatformed or otherwise disfavored or slowed down or throttled uh, by these tech companies. But I asked them, can you name one example of a Democrat or a liberal individual or group that's had that happen to them. They both reacted the same way, kind of saying, well, I'm sure we can name a lot. And they said, I'm not asking you if you can name a lot. I'm asking you to name one. And they said, well, we've got people on the left and on the right mad at us. And I pointed out, that's not really the point either. The folks on the left are mad at you for a very different reason. The folks on the left are mad at you for, because they believe you should be censoring more. What I'm asking you is if you could name a single example corresponding to those that we can all come up with on the right, where you've done that to somebody on the left. And they couldn't, and they didn't, and that's very telling. So that is its own form of, um, of, of censorship. Now, a private for-profit corporation, of course, has the right to stand for any political position it wants to. My point is that if they're going to do that, they've got to be honest about what they are. They can't tell you that they're even and uh, neutral in the way they handle this and then do the opposite of that. Yeah, I mean, I think this kind of is boils down to what's most interesting, which is the matter of perspective. I mean, I think, as you mentioned, both people on the left and the right have issues. Some of them are the same, some of them are different with where the line is between content moderation, hate speech, misinformation, and free speech. And the question then becomes, what is government's job to regulate? Because if the complaint from government is that you feel that private companies are not being fair in their attack, but yet we want to be careful about putting laws against private companies, where is that line? Because it is a matter yeah. of perspective. No, it's a good question. The short answer is that the law is able to distinguish between, on the one hand, uh, free speech rights, and on the other hand, conduct that is considered non-speech under the First Amendment. Again, yelling fire in a crowded theater where there is no fire. Uh, uh, things like that are not themselves speech under the First Amendment. Anything that can be uh, 
restricted from government property by government uh, uh, might, for example, be something uh, or, or not just government property, but a public forum, say the courthouse steps, might be something that a, uh, um, a free speech platform like a social media company might be able to exclude on its own. Now, they don't have to do that. Part of what the First Amendment means uh, in both the free speech free press and freedom of association uh, protections within the First Amendment is that if you want to start a company that has a certain viewpoint or an online service of one form or another that has a particular viewpoint, that is part of your First Amendment right to do that. And even if that means you want to exclude all people on the right or all people on the left or all people uh, with this or that viewpoint that you don't like, that is your right to do it. Um, and so that shouldn't become the government's right, but it does become the government's right to do it if they're lying about what service they're providing. And at that point, it's not about the speech, it's about the, the uh, misrepresentation of the service they're offering. It becomes a deceptive trade practice at that point. Interesting. Senator, this is a complicated issue and it's so important to all of us because it affects pretty much everything we do. We really appreciate you taking the time to come out and dig through some of this with us on these ASP chats. Oh, thank you. It's it's great talking to you. Look forward to doing it again sometime. Sounds Take good. Care. Thank you so much. Good to see you, sir.